Well, good morning and thank you. I have some prepared comments for what seems to spring to mind. I don't know if you have a lump in your throat like I do now, so I'm kind of trying to push through, but it'll be good. Uh, you know, we often sometimes say that the uh, phrase, uh, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, but I think that's being powerfully reinforced by what we're hearing uh, so far today, just that encouragement around relationships uh, and hope and optimism. Um, so thank you for a minute here today. Uh, in the last decade, we've learned much about how the brain functions. Understanding brain development is critical for, ed for educators, but why is this understanding necessary? Research from Harvard and Stanford medical schools, as well as others, have found that children who experience to toxic stress have an increased risk of learning problems, score lower on standardized tests, or more likely than others to be suspended or expelled, more likely to fail a grade, and have poorer overall health. The impact of trauma may include anxiety, withdrawal, aggression, perfectionism, or impulsivity that may hinder a student's ability to learn. Currently, many educators may interpret these behaviors as just problematic behaviors or willful disobedience not understanding the control the brain has over these actions. By understanding brain development, we can make our classrooms and schools even better equipped to meet the needs of both students and staff. And understanding brain development can provide better guidance for our policies and practices. I'm here today because I have a desire to learn more about how the brain develops and functions, the impacts on student learning and development, and potential solutions to support our students. Like many others, I'm, I'm making a pledge and I would encourage you to do the same. I pledge to continue to learn more about the impact of toxic stress on students and their learning and development, and to use this and other information to guide decisions about supporting the whole child as we move forward with the work of the Department of Education. With that, we are pleased to have us join, uh, to join us today, three school leaders who live and breathe this work on a daily basis in their metro schools. They will tell you more about their work, but please help me welcome Stephanie McFarland, Early Childhood School Social Worker with Des Moines Public Schools, Craig Leager, Des Moines School Principal, formerly at Walnut Street Elementary and currently Principal at Goodrill Middle School, and Kim Davis, Principal of Walnut Creek Campus Alternate High School in West Des Moines. Please help me join them in welcoming them. Good morning. Uh, when I agreed to do this, there were about a fourth of you, of you out there. So um, I have a little deer in the headlight look. Please forgive me. My name is Stephanie McFarland, and I have been a mental health clinician uh, for the better part of 15 years. And um, when I was in private practice, um, I had the good fortune to be able to participate in a 15-week um, study with the Child Trauma Academy and Dr. Bruce Perry. And um, when I was in private practice, I opted not to work with children under the age of eight and under an unfortunate circumstances a couple of times when people would land in my schedule who might be five or six. Um, I, um, I felt very inept. And it was through the course of this um, study that um, many of the recommendations that came out was um, the preparative work done in the three to five-year-old age group. And lo and behold, um, I had two of them in my house um, a child that was three and four, and um, another child that was four. And so um, a job opening came up in early childhood, and I thought, well, I'm living it. I might as well jump right in. So this is some of the things that we've done in Des Moines Public Schools. Um, we're operating from a model called the Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation Model. It is a problem-solving and capacity-building intervention. We focus on the healthy social and emotional development of children aged three to five, in our preschool centers, we have about uh, 1,800 children, and there are three of us. During this developmental period, there's significant growth in children's capacity to experience, regulate, and express emotions, form secure attachments, and explore their environment. A child's behavior, um, because we look at behavior, is communication. It's understood in the context of an age-appropriate developmental sequence, as well as the relationships between the caregivers and children. Teachers um, are considered caregivers. And then factors in the broader environment that impact the child and the family. Um, all three of us have a um, uh, licensed independent social work. Um, 
We have two types. Child and family centered, which is the more traditional form that you may think of of a consultant, um, that where staff may initially seek assistance um, about a particular child or family situation. Um, we develop a plan and um, may include the caregiver as the parent and the teacher in that plan, as well as um, individualized interventions. Our programmatic hat that we wear um, is one of my more favorite ones, but we don't focus on the children, um, but focus on supportive environments and facilitating our program success in supporting staff members and family as sort of the other two parts um, in a child's life. Creating a pro-social learning environment, improving um, everyone's knowledge about healthy social emotional development, and um, being able to have early identification of any mental health concerns. This all requires a holistic view, um, and that healthy mental development of children is impacted by the healthy mental health of their caregivers. And um, thankfully, someone else gave you that bad information about the 13 times that preschoolers are expelled compared to their K-12 counterparts. And um, our evidence is showing that programs that integrate a mental health perspective have a strong focus um, on prevention and intervention and a decrease in expulsion rates of our children. Um, early childhood providers report that it increased numbers of children with special needs um, that may or may not um, qualify under IDEA as a disability. About 10 to 30 percent of children um, exhibit behavior. Um, I won't go through much of the, the toxic stress that's already been talked about, but getting a little bit to our evidence-based um, models that we utilize. We have um, PBIS, or Positive Behavior Intervention and Supportive Environments. We teach kids what to do rather than what not to do. The multi-tiered systems of support is a way to assist children um, who are needing some extra support. CPI, if anyone's ever heard of crisis prevention and intervention, but working on matching behaviors um, to where children are at. Um, we have the ages and stages, social, emotional, developmental screen. We ask parents to fill out developmental screens as well as our social emotional curriculum called Second Step. And then um, within our assessments, we assess social emotional development as well. So we're kind of wrapping around getting the um, caregiver of the parent information on how they're seeing the social emotional development of their children, as well as how teachers are um, being able to measure that in the classroom. Um, this is probably not much you can see here, but this is a little bit of our data to our funders. Um, where you, the things I'd like to point out are the number of children that we are serving has increased significantly, um, as well as the family consultations, um, and um, the number, percentage of children has decreased that have been identified um, with a disability. Um, in our, um, as much as I'd like to believe that it's just us, it is not. We, be, we support a therapeutic environment. And so our family supports continuum. Um, obviously at the top are teachers. Um, we have case managers doing home visiting, as well as family engagement facilitators that help with um, supporting our um, centers, um, having events, giving information to parents, bringing parents into the classroom so that teachers and parents together, which we call pack time, um, can experience one another as both sides of the caregivers of children. Um, and our three-tiered approach foundationally, um, we do a lot with supportive environments. And in my 45 seconds that I have left, I do want to add a little bit about um, um, when I worked with older children and came into um, seeing how their behavior, some of the things that really struck out for me was the developmental age of some of our 13, 14, 15-year-olds. And when we see someone who's dysregulated, our um, value in being a secure base for them, regardless of their age, is extremely important. So thank you for letting me share this morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Craig Leeger, and I've had the uh, great pleasure and honor over the past 14 years to serve Des Moines Public Schools. The bulk of that has been as an elementary educator, 
Um, this year I've made the transition to adolescence um, as the principal at Goodrill Middle School. But the past six I've served as principal at Walnut Street School. Um, and what I will share with you as we go through these slides is really the journey that um, we took as a school, but it was really an evolution and awakening for me as a professional because I know, being a reflective practitioner, that the work that I did when I was a classroom teacher did not always embrace this. So it is an evolution as we think about how we can continue to grow and improve. Um, so hopefully these points will be valuable. Our end point as a school, our guiding principle, this is where we ended after six years of work. Um, that we really as a school community began to recognize that um, we needed to treat behavioral errors like academic errors. Um, when we think about the context of students and learning, if they were to have a challenge or a struggle with an academic issue such as learning how to add or subtract, we know that the punitive nature of our actions would not help them learn those things. In a situation where they don't learn their academics, we know that we can gain ground by reteaching. That is no different when it comes to behavioral incidents. Um, we have an obligation to refocus our own efforts in supporting them. And that message has kind of been resounding throughout the morning with all of the presenters. Here's a list of some of the things we implemented. In real estate, we know it's all about location, location, location. Um, in education, our key word is relationships. And it's relationship regardless of your job title. Reaching out to kids, reaching out to their families, building those relationships. That's something that innately we know, but I think in a day and age where there's high pressure, when it, we look at the public accountability around academics, we sometimes push those social and emotional pieces to the side. We can't do that. We have to first and foremost meet those social and emotional needs so that we can get to a place where academics are improving and moving forward. Um, one of the other things we really did is beyond those one-to-one -one connections and building relationships is helping kids create a sense of community in their own classrooms but across the school. Um, in, in our own experience, we just happened to use Responsive Classroom as one of many tools to do that, but being very intentional to help support them along the way. Also, when you talk about elementary students, and, and I would wager to say, even in my short time at middle school, this is true, and, and I would imagine that when we get to high school, uh, we'll hear a similar thing. It's digging in to those feelings and those emotions that students are presenting. When we have a better understanding of why or what the function of those behaviors are, we are better apt to match a response that's appropriate. And for elementary students specifically, the work we have to do is to give them the words to be able to express what it is they're trying to communicate. Um, and then that just ties into being able to process action planning around future incidents and then providing lots of professional development. Because again, though individually we've got some innate recognition around the relationships, processing, and connecting, we only get better when we can have discourse with our colleagues um, to improve our practice. Um, some of the additional things we implemented when we look specifically at supporting the adults um, is doing professional development that's not a sit and get, but engaging them in conversations um, and talking about functions of behavior. Um, oftentimes function of behavior is something that we see sit in the special education world, but that's best practice, and we know that. That needs to go across our gen ed students as well, and supporting our gen ed teachers in understanding that. Um, you know, we also looked at what are the skill deficits that kids have, and recognizing that when a behavioral incident happens, though it may feel like a personal affront, it's really not about us. And that's a hard one. You know, the way we support adults around that is giving them the opportunity to talk about what it is that's bothering them when a behavior is presented. Giving them an opportunity to have some discourse. 
hear from their colleagues who handle it in a different way. Again, I've already touched on understanding a function of behavior. When we understand that function of behavior, then we can match appropriate strategies to it. Um, we also um, implemented crisis prevention intervention um, with all of our staff, and we built systems where that happened every year. So not only was it a beginning of the year training, but we did monthly trainings throughout, um, and all staff, regardless again of job title, were focused in on that learning. Why do we do that? Um, obviously it's for the whole child, looking at cognitive, physical, social, and emotional needs, um, and then fostering a sense of belonging. Kids need to know that they belong there and have a sense of connection. And also, those feelings and emotions are the gateway for students to understand themselves and how they fit in to the connections with others. Just a little quick data, um, six years ago, um, our school had approximately 100 students. Um, we had over 700 office referrals. I'll let you do the ratio math on that. Um, it was very punitive oriented. Um, there was no systematic staff training, and frankly, I would say there wasn't any staff training related to supporting um, adults with how we can better handle this. Um, there we go. Six years later, um, you know, our office referrals, our school had grown. We had tripled in size, so we had just over 300 students. Office referrals, so again, 250 students, um, but we felt we had made tremendous progress because even with those office referrals, we knew we were looking at function of behavior and matching interventions to support those students. And again, um, this was all about building those relationships, helping students self-regulate, problem solve, um, and these are just prerequisite skills to being a successful citizen. Thank you. Good morning. I'm not an expert with a clicker, so if I review a slide, it's probably not on purpose. I'll do my best to operate this efficiently and effectively. I'm Kim Davis, and I have been in the West Des Moines District for the past 13 years, and I started at Valley High School as an assistant principal. And when I was conducting discipline conferences, I started to notice that kids would come into my office, I would give them their consequence, they would go away, and then they would show up the next day because they obviously hadn't corrected their behavior. So I started to think about how maybe that paradigm needed to shift how maybe I needed to do something a little bit different with students. So I started doing some different things when I was at Valley High School. I could give you an example. I have seven minutes, so I'm going to need to talk quickly. But I had a student, his name was Travis, and he did not like the lunch lady. And he walked through the lunch line, and he licked his finger, and he looked at her with a sneer, and he wiped his finger through the ketchup vat. Well, she brought him to my office, and I think she wanted him decapitated, and when I let her know that wasn't going to be a possibility, we talked about what might make sense. So we landed on the idea that Travis would pay for the ketchup that he had ruined. I think it was about $10. And then we decided that he really needed to get to know this lunch lady. So I had him come in and work with her over the course of the next week for several times in the morning, and they developed a good relationship. And that was the end of that. We had no more catch-up incidents with Travis. I started doing lots of things like that. Uh, if kids would deface property, I would have them come in in the morning and they would work with the custodian and clean those things up and build those relationships. Then we had to go away from that. Some silly thing called child labor laws uh, got in the way of my innocent work. Uh, it seemed to make sense to me. So we had to adjust what we were doing a little bit. And then my dream job came open, and the principal at Walnut Creek Campus, the alternative high school in West Des Moines, left. And so I went there, and I have been there for the past 10 years. And it is a complete joy to work with the students that I do there. We love the F word at Walnut Creek Campus, and that's flexibility. Um, and I'd like to talk to you just about a little bit about what we implemented. I don't have time really to go over every word on every slide, so I'm going to just go quickly through some basic information. But 
basically we are a restorative school and we have been on that train ride for about 10 years. Um, when I first came to Walnut Creek, I noticed that a lot of the staff thought about working with kids the same way that I did. I partnered with Claudia Henning, who is the head of the restorative justice program in the West Des Moines community. And we started talking about how we might start to implement restorative justice practices into the school setting. So a lot of times in our school, we will ask students, how can you make this right when you have done something that you shouldn't have? Basically what I consider to be good parenting. Restorative practice helps students, staff, and families give and ask for support. So I will often have parents in my conversations with them that are in need of assistance, and I know as a school person that if that student loses that home placement, that will impact their school performance. So we really think of ourselves as one big family working collaboratively with one another to help kids be successful at home and at school. We use circles conflict mediation and restitution, and then of course we just have a restorative culture in general. There's a discipline continuum, so punishment is on one end. This is how I explain it to people who are not familiar. So generally when you're in a punishment mode, which most high schools are, you do something, you get a consequence. When I worked at Valley, there was even a handbook that said, you do this, you get this, you do this, you get this. Well, as we know, kids just don't fit into neat little packages like that, and therefore there wasn't behavior change. So I started thinking about working with kids in a different way and work down the continuum towards the restoration. So in restoration, victims also have a voice, which is a lot different than in that punishment mode. And of course, we're looking for behavior change. That's what we're after. I have a counseling background, so I tend to think a little bit differently, as you can imagine, working in the school setting with students. Uh, restorative practices help to uncover this. What do restorative schools do? Well, they focus primarily on relationships, and I would reiterate what everybody has said up to this point, that relationships are key when we are trying to uncover what is going on with a student and how can we help them to change their behavior. They give a voice to the person harmed and to the person who caused the harm. They seek to recognize the motivation driving the misbehavior, enhance the sense of responsibility to the community by engaging in collaborative problem solving. So it's not doing something to kids, it's doing something with kids. It's a collaborative process, which is a key ingredient for a successful program. Empower change and growth, which is what we're all about in our school, and encourage responsibility by planning for restor restoration. And those would be the action steps that we write down when we are working in our circles or when we have conflict mediations. Before I came to Walnut Creek, there were a lot of restorative thinkers, but there wasn't a pervasive restorative model in the school. And there was a relationship with the Youth Justice Initiative Program, which is the diversion program that Claudia runs in our community for kids who have committed low-level crimes, but there wasn't a real strong connection to the school. And there were no formal conflict mediation processes in the school, nor were there circles of support and concern. So I'm always, as a past counselor in particular, always asking what is the function of the behavior, which was mentioned earlier, and for you special ed folks, that's sounding very familiar. So a lot of you know about Glasser, an oldie but a goodie, and Glasser is always encouraging us to look beyond the behavior and what need is a student trying to meet? So that would be belonging, power, fun, freedom, or survival. And also, an oldie but a goodie would be Maslow's because if kids' basic needs are not met, okay, there's a graphic for that, which the basic needs are on the bottom. And of course, a need to know and understand is up there in the middle. So I always explain to people that if those basic needs aren't met, it's as if that student's kind of bumping their head on that level. They can't progress up to that next level where kids are able to be um, educated, to be able to know and understand. Okay, I went back on purpose. I'm getting this clicker thing down finally. Um, we have, I could go on and on about different examples in the school setting that, where we have used the restorative practices. We have a student currently that we are working with who has had a long history with us. He is a drug user. He almost overdosed last year in our school setting. He went away to treatment. He came back and he was in a good place and now we believe he's relapsed and he has done some um, stealing. Uh, he, he's stolen from a teacher who has a very good relationship with him. So we are working through that process in the circles in the school right now. Last year we had a student who had previously been in YJI who was in a crisis, uh, actually the whole family system was in a crisis, and they came into the school with the past YJI people and myself, 
and the support person that he worked with in that program, and we worked with that entire family system after school hours to try to get that student on track. And I thought that the work that we did was very beneficial for the family, and the student was able to graduate at the end of the year. Uh, we've had students who felt unsafe. There was a breakup. Uh, the student felt that her safety was in jeopardy. I had both of the parents of the students come in, and we did some circle work surrounding that to get through that situation. Safety is the most important thing in the school, of course. And you can always hear me say, my kids need to feel safe. A lot of our kids, of course, have had traumatic backgrounds and are witness to violence in the home. And I always tell my kids that school is going to be the one safe place that all my kids can count on. When school becomes an unsafe place, we have a problem. Schools have become larger, of course, and more impersonal, and kids feel less and less connected. So that relationship piece is key for change to occur. Restorative practices help misbehaving students deal with the harm they have caused to individuals and to the school community as a whole. And instead of doing something to people, as I said before, this process works with people. And that would be called reintegrative shaming, where the student's able to be held accountable for their behavior, but then action steps are made so that the behavior can change. Change is hard. And I know a lot of my colleagues um, have trouble thinking out of the box because they're in the box, right? We've all heard that before. Uh, one good quote about change that I always like to tell people is by Sally Ogden, and she said, the only people who really like to be changed are wet babies. Right? Um, but this is hard work and this is valuable work, and I would be happy to have any of you come to my school and observe what we do or to talk to you further about it. And I'd like to leave you just with a thought from Apollinaire, a French poet, and he said, when thinking about change and going on to the next step, come to the edge, he said, but they were afraid. Come to the edge, he said, but we are afraid, they said. Come to the edge, he said. They came to the edge, he pushed them, and they were able to fly. Thank you. As we've heard what local schools are doing, we want, to not, we want to highlight an example of from across the state where schools in the justice system have, have formed a partnership to serve their youth. And they're looking through the lens of brain development as they do this. So please welcome Ann Feldman, Associate Superintendent of Iowa City Schools, Joan Vandenberg, Youth and Family Development Coordinator for Iowa City Schools, and Deborah Minot, Associate Judge for the 6th Judicial District in Johnson County. Welcome. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? OK, that was weak. <laughs> uh, we are here as a team, and so we're going to tag team it with the microphone. So if you can't hear us in the back, tough nugs. Okay. <laughs> so we're here to talk about uh, an issue that we're dealing with in our community and that is a, an over-representation of students of color in the juvenile justice system. And so we discovered that there are many players in this system. There are lots of systems working on behalf of kids. Uh, how many of you recognize your system? Everybody point to your system. I want to see if you're awake out there. All right. You notice that the arrows are going in lots of different directions, don't you? We like to point fingers at the other systems, don't we? Yes, we do. And so we attempted in our community to have the systems work together to create what we hope to be a unified system on behalf of kids. And we were able to achieve this thanks to some funding from the juvenile court, and we sent a team to Georgetown University to go through an intensive week-long training. We have two participants here who went to Georgetown. So I was one of the fortunate members that got to be a part of that team. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit first about collaboration because it makes so much sense to work together. We want the same thing for our kids, but it doesn't happen. And it's very, very challenging. And I think we have different backgrounds that we come from. We speak a different language. Our different systems use different terms that we don't always understand. 
Um, and we also have different expectations and um, different things that we're accountable for for the people that we report to. So Georgetown um, was a great solution for us to have that joint training, because I think that's absolutely imperative to a good collaboration is, first of all, to take the time to get to know your different systems, but then also to have some professional development together. So we had um, myself as a school district representative, um, Judge Minot, a juvenile probation officer, um, and a law enforcement person and a community leader. And so we had a week together. Our organizations gave us that time that we got excellent, excellent training on racial and ethnic disparities across systems of care, which I think is really important because we all understood what our role was in this issue and also what we could do about it. So my big aha moment was that we were just looking at it through different lenses. So in our district, we have six secondary schools and we had 6,000 um, office referrals. And 40 of those kids were referred to um, law enforcement. I was really proud of that. I thought that's less than 1% of our population that's getting referred to law enforcement. So I'm you know, all proud of that. But meanwhile, my colleagues in the court system said, 40 kids, for us, that's 10% that's of our whole caseload. And that's also half of all the kids who have a disorderly conduct. That's a big issue. So we're at cross purposes. I'm thinking what is a success they're seeing as an issue. So without that dialogue, it, it's hard for us to find that common ground. We spent that five days talking a lot about the whys of disproportionality, and that meant that we had to talk about some things that we don't like to talk about. Uh, if we look around this room, I think we can see disproportionality in action. We had to talk about history. We had to talk about policy. We had to talk about politics. We had to talk about racism, prejudice, and bias. Tough stuff. There were a lot of motions that came out during that week, even among the professionals gathered there. Confusion, anger, defensiveness, frustration, and even helplessness. We know what the problem is, we said. What can we do about it? Georgetown pushed us to look beyond those emotions, to look at the facts. In their words, follow the data. We found somehow that made it easier to talk about. And strangely enough, it began to lift some weight off of our shoulders because we realized we were not alone. Virtually every state, county, and school district had the same problems, even ones whose minority populations looked very different than our own, even ones whose minority populations were the majority. So when we followed the data, we began to understand four important realities. Number one, most adolescent behaviors are not crimes. Number two, if we, uh, delinquency charges can have long lasting, increasingly permanent impacts. Number three, if we wanna help kids, we should help them. We shouldn't charge them. And number four, if our system looks uh, like we have big disparities at the beginning, those disparities will persist and increase at every stage of the juvenile process and beyond, all the way to jail and prison. So now that we understood the problems, we began to look for solutions. Talked to a lot of people who are way ahead of us and looked at some who were far behind. We spent time there as a team, talking about where we wanted to start. Before we left Georgetown, we had a project, we had a timetable. Now it was time to come home and get to work. We decided that one thing we had to do was to initiate some courageous conversations in our community, like the ones we'd been able to have at Georgetown. In order to do that, we decided to start with four basic assumptions. Number one, everybody wants the best for all of our kids. Number two, everyone wants good schools, strong families, and safe communities. Everybody wants that. Number three, we can talk without judging or attacking. And we can listen without feeling attacked or judged. And number four, no one person, school, group, or agency 
is solely to blame for this problem, and no one alone is going to fix it. This last one was very important. Many of the community conversations we'd had back home had focused on acts of racism and bias, and those emotions were in full display. And there were many of us who felt that, well, we're not part of the problem because we treat people fairly. I'm a judge, right? I'm fair. But disproportionality is not an individual problem. It's a system problem, and like you see, our mantra became system problems require system solutions. So if you're following the data, a lot of the emotion can be taken out of the equation. The data is, data are what they are, right? We have disproportionality. Now let's get to work. So as a school system, we have to consider ourselves upstream in the problem, okay? So if you're thinking about water systems, what you put upstream affects everything downstream. And so as a school system, we're upstream from the courts, from the police, and what we put into the system affects the system. And so if we're disciplining kids in a disproportionate way, then we're affecting the whole system. It's the pipeline. So what we don't want to do is contribute to the pollution of the system, I guess you could say. So as a school district, we looked at our data and we decided to make some goals around that. So this is a chart that shows our discipline data in the secondary schools in the Iowa City Community School District. And the blue line represents 2012-2013 office referrals. What's the number one reason for office referrals? Defiance and disrespect. Define that. Right? Ask yourself how that can contribute to disproportionality. Answer to a neighbor. How does that contribute? How does it contribute? It's in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Defiance and disrespect, the kid with the lighter, right? So we set goals around this. As the assistant superintendent, I said, you may not suspend a student for defiance and disrespect, period. Okay, now the building principals had to go back and figure out, all right, now what do I do? That was that loose, tight relationship we have with our principals. My goal is to have them come back to me and say, well, our teachers need cultural competence training. Then I know I've got them, right? So the red line represents a year of working on this, a year of saying that option's off the table. Guess what? It went down. So that's how we worked looking at our data as a school system. And so from there, how does the school and how do our decisions impact the rest of the system? Well, I had mentioned earlier that we had, 6, 000, or had 40 referrals to law enforcement. And so we wanted to take a good hard look about our policies of when we call police. And we wanted to make sure that it was for safety or a, um, a juvenile delinquency act and not for school infractions. And we also then designed a program Another goal, a joint goal of all the members of our system, was to try to keep kids out of that infamous school to prison pipeline. So when we followed our data, we looked hard at the charge of disorderly conduct. That's fighting in school. That was both our most frequent school offense and our most disproportionate. And that's what became our focus. It involved a small number of kids, these 40 kids, so it seemed like a doable project. Just what the Georgetown staff harped on us over and over and over again, pick a small project, they said, experience some success, and then build on that success. 
So we decided to develop a graduated response to fighting behavior within the schools. Sort of a first time you get a warning, second time you get something, and third time you go to the juvenile court office with a charge. What was that something in the middle? We wanted to create a new diversion program, one that would hold kids accountable for their behaviors, prevent reoffending, and to treat all kids fairly, to give all kids with the same behaviors the same option. This involved training and educating police, school administrators, probation officers, and in the process, involving and informing our community. So if this plan works, we hope to reduce the number of disorderly conduct charges through prevention, school-based interventions, and diversion. Hopefully, we'll also see reduced rates in our disproportionality statistics. So, there you have it. We sent a team to Georgetown. We tried to get all the players together so our goals were to follow the data. Sorry, we're not professionals at this. Can you tell me? Um, follow the data. So look at your data. What, is, what do your data tell you? For us, it was defiance and disrespect and um, the charges. Yeah. And so, what, you know, so it went, we went from the school to the community. And so we um, want to be clear about how we're involving law enforcement and set goals for the discipline and then also divert kids away from juvenile court. Ready for the, this is our big finish, so pay close attention. <laughs> and then you get lunch. Okay. So our little team of five, which was really six, but anyway, we returned from Georgetown almost exactly one year ago today. That's my stuffed book, and that is my certificate. Uh, we came home with a project and a plan and a newfound passion. In May, after many months of work, we got invited to speak at a community forum uh, addressing resolving racial disparities in our youth serving systems. We had some wonderful speakers. It was over two hours long, but somehow our 10 minute presentation caught the attention of a local TV station and the paper in Cedar Rapids. There's your very own Joan Vandenberg there. and the Iowa City Press Citizen, and along the way, a few other people, including the Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court, who attended one of our team meetings in Iowa City in July. For the first time ever, that's an editorial, our school system got a shout out for the local press. How often does that happen? Uh, just for trying to tackle a tough problem. And yes, as of today, we have the first new diversion program in Johnson County in over 30 years. It started on August 18th, the first day of school. We have a contract, we have a provider, and we have a brochure. Before our program ever started, the Iowa City Police Chief said, can't we expand this beyond the schools? Why do kids get a disorderly conduct in school, he said, and get diversion, but not if they get one at the rec center? And we said, why not indeed? So we've made this available to any kid with a disorderly conduct type charge. And now it's not a charge, by the way, it's a referral. So now, in addition to all that, our little team has this very ambitious plan to expand pre-charge diversion programs to include all first time simple misdemeanor offenses in Johnson County by next year. And most importantly, just a few days ago, we had our first successful completion. So thank you so much for your time and I would really encourage you all to get to know each other across systems. Um, it takes some time, but it's so important to work smart. Follow your data and seek those system solutions and, and figure out a doable project that you can start on and build your success. So, and, and also thank you so much for all the hard work that you do. You guys are doing amazing work. It's just working smarter and connecting the dots. So see you at lunch. Thank you.